Hey, Deliberate Leaders, I am your host, Allison Dunn, executive coach and founder of the Deliberate Leaders podcast dedicated to helping leaders build strong, thriving businesses. Each episode, we feature inspiring interviews to help you on your leadership journey. And our guest today, I'm excited to introduce, we have with us Andrew Bartlow. Um, he is a growth company advisor with over 25 years of experience in human resource and talent management. He is also the co-author of Scaling for Success and also the founder of Series B Consulting, which helps businesses to articulate their people strategy, accelerate their growth while navigating rapid change. Um, today, we're going to discuss some of the challenges and strategies uh, in uh, recruiting and building a recruiting team in this year of 2021. Andrew, thanks so much for joining us today. Allison, really happy to be here. Thanks so much for inviting me. My pleasure. So I tee these up with a deliberate conversation. And so my question for you to kick this off is what would be your number one leadership tip for our deliberate leader listeners? Oh boy, I think this plays into the, the word deliberate. It's plan, have a plan. Um, boy, when things are changing quickly, when your company's growing, when the world around us is crazy, um, that often becomes an excuse for so many leaders and so many organizations to say, I don't have time or it's changing too fast. We can't plan. And boy, that's something I just double down on and encourage leaders to, uh, have a, at least a directional plan that, you know, will evolve. Uh, but boy, you're never going to get there unless you have a general idea where you're going. So have a plan as a deliberate leader. You are speaking my language. Um, I, um, I beat that drum constantly uh, in my local community. And um, it is amazing how many people are just kind of shooting from the hip. <laughs> yep. um, so with that, thank you very much for that tip. That's a great tip. Um, so in your area of expertise, I know that you um, focus on a lot of startup type companies, but there are so many um, elements of um, kind of the years of expertise that you bring in just human resources. So um, in this year, 2021, what should be um, the, the key things that um, business leaders are thinking about from the standpoint of their people strategy? Sure, sure. Well, um, yeah, there are a number of things happening around us that, uh, you know, hey, I'll highlight it. Um, COVID, the pandemic, um, the world is adjusting and business is reopening. Um, how are we handling that as employers with our workers and with our customers and various legal and compliance uh, elements? There's a lot there. Um, and boy, I've been leaning on various law firms for their guidance along the way and, you know, directing them, getting them connected with my clients. You know, I, I'm not the legal and compliance expert, but I know where to go for help. Uh, so that's a big part of it. Okay. Another thing that's been a hot topic uh, it has been remote work. Mm -hmm. So now that we've lived like this on video and Zoom uh, calls for, for many months, um, what will the world of work look like afterwards, after it becomes a choice rather than a mandate that we're, uh, that we can work in an office together or, or on video? How does the, how does that mix change? Will there be more distributed environments? Will some people live high cost, leave high cost of living areas? Like I live in the San Francisco Bay area and Boy, people are headed headed east, headed to Austin, Boise. Texas. Yeah, headed to Boise, headed to Colorado. Yeah. People are getting the heck out of Dodge. Mm -hmm. And and how do you deal with that? Um, do you adjust salaries? That's been a hot topic um, mm -hmm. as a result of, of remote work. Yeah, so lots to talk about there. Um, in, um, in your, uh, experience, or at least in your circles, um, what is the typical approach that you're finding most businesses are taking to, um, to the remote aspect of like, are they keeping it? Are they hybriding it? Like, or have they completely given up their office spaces? What are, what are you finding? Yeah, most, uh, most commercial office leases are long-term in nature, three, five, seven, even 10, 10 plus years. So you, 
most employers have not been able to sublease or let go of their commercial leases. It just hasn't been an option. So, you know, it, everybody is, is dealing with that overhead, but, but thinking about um, how can they operate going forward in a lower cost way, in a way that appeals to more workers. So they haven't actually, most, most groups haven't actually let go of their offices yet because they can't get out of the leases. Um, now going forward, I just saw a study uh, Lightspeed Ventures uh, published a study. There's a great article. It's out on LinkedIn. It's out on medium.com. Uh, Luke is the talent partner there who does a bunch of great work. And they did um, a survey across about 300 companies in their portfolio, uh, you know, gro growth stage, you know, venture uh, organization. And uh, they are anticipating roughly 60% of organizations will be in a flexible work environment moving forward, meaning employee choice, at least several days work remote, uh, no longer the general expectation that you're in the office the vast majority of the time. So a lot more flexibility moving forward. And boy, I, um, I should pull up the, re the report while we're, while we're talking about it to reference it. But uh, there are a lot more organizations that are that are distributed first, mm -hmm. um, that are hiring people from everywhere just to expand their talent pool. In um, so I just also did a similar um, uh, review on the summary of getting feedback. I'm going to include the one that you've just mentioned in the show notes, um, and right. also the one um, that I've just kind of absorbed myself. It's a big topic that we have at an upcoming strategic meeting. Uh, so my question going back to that is, is the hybrid, are you anticipating, like I think of a hybrid model of maybe it's shared office, maybe it's co-shared space, it's smaller, it's less square footage. Um, what do you anticipate are the people challenges that will be around that along coupling with COVID consciousness? Yeah, well, well, space, you know, what's mine? Um, what? How do you how do you handle you know physical meetings? You know, folks are used to many many folks in an office environment are are used to having their own desk. Some people are fortunate enough to have a door that closes. Um, that that is likely to be less frequent. It's likely to look a lot more like the the WeWorks of the world with communal hoteling office space. Um, and, and, you know, I, I think employers are going to adapt to that. There's going to be less focus on some of those in-office perks like lunches and, um, you know, the activities in the office and more focus on things that are more meaningful to bring together a more distributed uh, workforce. You know, how, how do you engage people and build relationships when you're all over the place versus under one rooftop? Thank you. You um, you also brought up a really, uh, I think, important topic about um, wage, wage differences based on where um, where you're located. Uh, what what do you envision? How do you think companies are going to deal with that? I think companies are struggling with it right now in this uh, in this war for talent that we're in when all the companies seem to be competing for the same really highly skilled professionals with in demand, um, you know, technical skills, you know, that's driven wages way, way up, uh, especially in some of those magnet markets like the San Francisco Bay area or New York city or Singapore, you know, some of those, you know, really, really hot markets, uh, are so overheated. Um, employers are frankly excited about opening up their talent pool to be able to source people from all over the country, even all over the globe, now that we're more used to working in this remote environment. Um, and, and so they're excited about the labor arbitrage of hiring people for half or 10% of what they're used to paying in New York or San, San Francisco Bay, et cetera, where it gets complicated is when an employee or when a worker decides on their own, hey, I'm gonna move from this high labor cost area where I'm already working for you, I'm already earning this high wage, and now I'm gonna to move to Idaho. Um, does that employer adjust their pay down to match that local labor market? Some companies are saying yes, 
we should do that. It's only fair. We have wage compression issues. Otherwise, if we hired somebody in Idaho at, let's, let's pick a round number, 100 grand, and they're moving from the Bay Area where they were making 150 grand, it's awkward to maintain that person's pay and have this 50% disparity. It's awkward when it's just purely happenstance that that worker was hired in the Bay and then they moved. Um, some employers will do that. Yes. Um, I'm working with some employers that are choosing to do that. Uh, other employers, more employers, are um, using a, a practice that I call red circling. So you maintain the pay that somebody's at today, but you either freeze their wage or you increase it more slowly with your uh Mm -hmm. annual or semi-annual performance review, cost of living adjustments, you know, what, whatever method you have to increase people's pay, it's, it's a slower growth so that over time things start to equalize. Frankly, that's been around for a long time. You know, way back in the day, back in the 90s, I worked for General Electric and for Pepsi, uh, giant Fortune 50 companies that moved people around all over the, all, all over the place. And they to the best of my recollection, never took away base pay. They just increased it less slowly if you're moving from one market to another. And that's, that's a way to keep your workforce intact. If you start slashing people's pay, they're gonna start looking for another job, especially they're gonna look for another job at that third category of company, which I haven't talked about at all yet, which is we want these skilled workers so badly that we're willing to normalize across the country, across the globe in high labor cost area wages. So hey, if we're paying 150 for it in the Bay, we're gonna pay 150 for it in Atlanta or in Idaho. Um, we as an employer shouldn't care where that work, worker works because we're gonna pay this, this sum for it. And that will help those companies attract talent, but that will sure. cost those companies more money. So every company is going to need to make their own decision about which one of those three places they, they want to reside at on, on the scale. And I think that has to do with how much do you need the labor? What are your profit margins? You know, what, how much money do you have in the bank? Uh, each situation depends. I'm, I'm not going to recommend one scenario or another because it depends what your situation is as, a, as an employer. But those are the three big paths that I see people making choices around. Um, the aspect of the third um, the third model that you just mentioned, you know, if I think about, you know, if, um, if you're in the Bay, right, and you're currently employed there, and typically they'd have 100 employees, and now they're remotely working, um, why would you pay them any less? It's been the burden or the overhead, the labor costs that's been built into your pricing structure. It's already there. At, at least I'd hope that they'd have that perspective as well. So interesting. It is certainly interesting. Yeah. And heck, as, as companies scale and they, they move from 100 employees to 1,000 employees, you're starting to deal with uh, perceptions of fairness. Right. Uh, pay, pay equity is very important. That impacts you know, trust and confidence in the employer sure. and whether people want to you know, stick with that employer or not. And as you start to get into situations with people moving around, um, and if you're able to hire somebody for a lower dollar amount as an employer, why wouldn't you? So the, the financial folks start to look at you a little cross-eyed if you are costing your organization twice as much, if you're making some decisions that, hey, we, we need to build this product really fast. We need to sell it really fast. We need some salespeople. We need some programmers. Um, wouldn't you rather have twice as many uh, by paying local market rates versus paying the high, the highest possible rate across all markets. So those are decisions employers need to make. And uh, those are discussions worth having. For sure. What um, in the current makeup of a human resource team, um, I know that you, um, you talk about how to scale it properly and building it from the ground up. So I'd love to kind of dive into that and then maybe how, um, the need for some new type of talent on HR teams might be necessary 
um, mm. in today's age. So let's talk about, you know, what should any business, regardless of where they're where they're at right now, be considering for building out an HR team? Sure, sure. Um, boy, that, this is my this is my sweet spot. I, uh, I I started a executive development program for HR leaders uh, to help them, you know, figure out what the role is and how to be successful in it at different stages. So most organizations start thinking about HR around hiring around talent acquisition. So even the very smallest organizations when you're 20, 25, if you're no longer hiring from within your network of first or second degree contacts, you're either paying an outside search firm or a recruiter or you're, you're bringing on board your own. And, and Allie, I know that you do some uh, recruitment for some of your clients. Um, so just about every organization needs recruiting help. So that's often where it starts. I'd like to suggest that if you're hiring 20 or less, like even 10 or less people per year, you can use your own insourced recruiter. Like, let's do the math on it, right? If you're paying an outside, you know, search partner somewhere between 20 and 35% of first year's cash comp, recruiter makes the average of that. So you're hiring three to five people a year internally, your recruiters paid for themselves, right? So if you're hiring five, 10, 20 people a year, you should certainly be insourcing recruitment. So that, that's typically the starting point of an HR organization. You'll often pair that with somebody running payroll in finance or accounting, mm -hmm. and then you know tag team in your office manager or executive assistant for your business owner or you know head of your business. So that's often mm -hmm. your your three headed uh, monster of an early stage or small business HR team: a recruiter, an office manager slash EA, and somebody running payroll. As you get bigger, it starts to become more important to have somebody you know, manage and maintain the various processes, programs, and policies that you have. So stage one is that you know, kind of three-headed three, three -headed monster of lots of the recruiter and some part-time jobs. Stage two is you have somebody in HR operations that can help you think through benefits and maybe payroll maybe reports into them. Um, they might be doing some of the recruiting or the recruiter reports into them. Uh, you're running some more attraction and retention programs, uh, some learning and development programs. Uh, so HR operations becomes more important. And then as you, and let, let's say that that kicks in at 50 to 150 employees is ballpark when you're looking at that. Past 150 employees, most organizations have three, four, even five layers of management between the CEO and the frontline workforce. Communication gets complicated. You can no longer easily make fair common sense decisions that make sense based off of an individual situation. You need to have more programmatic, more policy things, more dirty word structure um, to, to your organization. And that's where having a, a more professional, more seasoned leader in human resources to help you think through what are those management processes? What do those management practices look like? How should they work? How does it all connect to each other? That person's probably a member of your leadership team and the recruitment and ops roll up into them. So 150 plus for sure, you should, you should have a uh, relatively seasoned HR leader that, that's wearing a business hat, a business executive hat. Yeah. Does that answer the question? It, uh, it ab absolutely does. Uh, what, um, depending, I suppose, depending on the size of an organization, what are you, what are you seeing are some of the trends of how HR's role is changing in this, um, remote, uh, society that we're in right now? Yeah, well, remote's part of it. Um, legal compliance, pandemic related stuff is another part of it. Um, the, the social equity issues that have, even more strongly entered the uh, public consciousness and workplace discourse and the zeitgeist has, has um, been, been huge for employers and for HR leaders. Like we, we're expected to know 
how to deal with this. We're, we're expected to know how uh, COVID pandemic return to work stuff impacts us. We're, we're being asked to be uh, remote work experts as well. And how do we engage the team and maintain culture and all that good stuff. And, and, you know, bottom line, what I'm, what I'm seeing is a lot of burnout from a lot of HR leaders, more is being asked from them than at any point that I can recall in my 25 year career, even during the dot-com boom bust and, you know, et cetera. Um, and it's something, frankly, that not all HR leaders are prepared to handle. Um, not everybody has the resources and community at their disposal to get the answers to this. Um, you know, lot, lots of HR folks are fan, you know, fantastic in their lane, you know, maybe moved from uh, that, that three-headed monster of maybe you came from recruiting or maybe you were a former office manager or uh, maybe you used to run payroll. Um, and then you were anointed as the head of human resources for your group without the training, without the experience, without the resource and network to figure out how to answer these questions. And so I've seen, and, and I have a bunch of um, you know close friends in the HR search world, um, I've seen and I've heard that there's there are more changes at the top of the HR organization than ever before in terms of people opting out, people being replaced, um, and the function being upgraded in many ways because organizations are seeing that they need more from their HR leaders. And the HR leaders are, are figuring out they, they need to know more and they, they need to have community and resources to be able to answer the these questions that had never really been contemplated before. Right. Thank you for that perspective. I, um, I know that um, I'm guiding clients on the types of shift in perks from like the in office, you know, like, you know, we've got a coffee machine and you've got, you know, lunch every once in a while and, you know, you've got office space and a computer. What are, um, what are some of the transitioning elements that that, uh, that professionals are expected or workers are expecting to have in their home environment that should all employers should consider at least evaluating on including as part of their benefits or as part of their work package? Yeah, great question. Oh my goodness. I've, and boy, I rail about this a little bit as well, where, where people, employers get really caught up in keeping up with the Joneses around what flashy perk you're offering. Like there, there's the joke about the Silicon Valley uh, ping pong tables and oh, we're, we're a company, we have a ping pong table now and, and the, the free lunches. There, there's so many dollars and so many hours put into perks and programs that don't matter, that don't move the needle. So rather than point out like, hey, here's one thing that's you know, super useful. I, actually, I'll give you a few at the back end of this, but I'd, I'd suggest the framework to think about perks and programs as an employer is what is really meaningful to your workforce. Are free lunches really meaningful? Those, those originated, by the way, in these giant campuses um, where it took a bunch of time for people to leave the workplace, to go out and get food and come back. And so the employer wanted them to be in the office longer and it was more efficient to provide the food. It saved them money, got more labor dollars, uh, got more productivity by keeping the people on campus. Um, so what's important to your workforce? What's important to you as an employer? What can make your workforce more productive and more likely to stay? It's not always what people are asking for. Really. Right. People are usually asking for more money. And yeah, we all want more money. Um, but what what really does your particular workforce need that will be meaningful to them? And some things will be table stakes. Some things will be an ante like health insurance. That's expected. Right. At a certain level, everybody ought to have uh, you know, medical insurance. Um, 401k. A lot of startups don't offer 401ks. It's just not something that early career millennial workers think a lot about retirement, even though it's super valuable. So that, that's an example of something where 
many technology startups with a you know, different demographic in their workforce have chosen to spend those dollars in other areas, the ping pong tables, the, the parties and the free food versus the 401k. But if you as an employer have a different workforce that you're trying to attract and retain, think about what's meaningful to them. So one of the things I, I uh, do a blog on my Series B consulting website, and you know, I talked about the plight of the working parents in the midst of COVID. Um, child care um, and even elder care. So um, how, how are we enabling workers to help them work, help them focus on their work? If their kids are at home and they're trying to take care of an aging uh, parent, that can be really challenging. So there, there are more benefits and programs that, that might be supportive in a more meaningful way. Right. That's an example. Mm-hmm. Um, mental health benefits mm-hmm. have been attracting a lot of attention, a lot of interest. Boy, you know, COVID and the work at home and the school at home environment has been really tough a lot of people in a lot of different ways. And so mental health is getting rightly more attention. Um, that, that's likely to be something that could be considered table stakes in the future. Um, so I don't know if I gave you enough specific examples, but you know, the general suggestion is think about what's important to your workforce. Don't just try to keep up with the Joneses. Excellent advice. And I think, um, you know, finding out what's important to your employees is just by simply asking them, right? Yeah. It is that simple. What are, um, what are some of the most common mistakes um, that you see businesses doing? Well, I, I just talked about one, which is keeping up with the Joneses, like assuming that because somebody else did something, you should do it too. Um, lots of business leaders that I work with, um, you know, they'll, they'll read an article or you know, HBR comes out with, you know, some, some interesting, you know, concept or best practice or the, the latest book comes out, uh, you know, uh, about some new practice or process like holacracy was the hot thing a number of years ago from Zappos and Ray Dalio's principles and, you know, how, how you operate your organization. Um, one of the biggest mistakes is best practicing. I'm giving air quotes is using somebody else's best practice that worked for them in their organization at some particular time in some particular context and thinking that that's naturally gonna work for you. Um, One of the things I talk to my clients about is context is more important than content. So if Google's doing something and you're a 50 person organization, chances are it could actually hurt you rather than help you, right? They're, they have tens of thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of employees right now, very different stage of maturity and talent and labor market environment and probably profit margin versus whatever your, your business has. So be really skeptical about others' best practices versus lifting and shifting those best practices. Um, way too many examples of business leaders Um, coming into the office on Monday with some, you know, flashy, you know, bright, shiny object, you know, great new idea that they heard about that they want to go implement on Tuesday. Um, So be, be really skeptical about best practices. Think about what your own needs are. Um, That that's one of the larger traps I've seen. Um, I'll give you one more quickly. One more. Um, I hear an awful lot about trying to maintain the culture trying to keep our culture as yep. we grow. Yep. Yeah. Did I, did I jump ahead <laughs> that, of a that, question? That, that, yeah. <laughs> you were, that was led right into the next question. <laughs> Telepathy. I love it. Um, yeah, that, that's one of the larger mistakes I've seen. And, and if your organization is growing, it should be, and it needs to be evolving. Mm-hmm. The, way that the, the way that you operate, the way that you communicate, the way that you make decisions at, Five people is different than at 50, and that's different than at 500, and it should be that way. At five, everybody knows everybody. You're able to you know, chat informally. You know what everybody's working on. At 50, you probably have middle managers involved. Communication is different. 
You're starting to insert a little bit of process and structure at 1500, at 500, much more process structure, programmatic stuff needs to be there to allow the organization to operate in a healthy way. And so this idea of how do we keep our culture, I think is inherently wrong. You know, how do you keep your core, your core values, what's important to you, it becomes more about how do you communicate and articulate what that core is and do it, do it in a clear and differentiated way to express who you really are and who you really want to, to be helpful in aligning people around what you're trying to accomplish versus trying to hold on to the past. And I've seen a lot, I've seen a lot of leaders try to hold on to the past. And that often ends up holding them back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you for addressing that. That's, I think, um, a, uh, a key challenge that I think everyone feels like they have, but if they focused around the, the core, they'll get it right every time. So not keep, not trying to keep it. Um, Andrew, what are your favorite HR tools or resources uh, that you would recommend? Oh my goodness. Um, one of my favorite, uh, authors, professors, um, I don't know him well enough to call him a mentor, but, uh, Dave Ulrich, uh, U-L-R-I-C-H, uh, the, the father of modern HR has written too many books, uh, actually blurbed my book. Um, I'm just forever honored that, uh, yes, thank you, uh, that, that he even answered my email. Um, but yeah, he, he really described how HR operates in the context of a business. Um, and so that, yeah, huge. Um, Patrick Lencioni's work around five dysfunctions of a team and the advantage. Uh, he has a more recent book out. I, um, I, I don't think that the science is particularly strong there, but the concepts are very practical and easy to grasp. And I use a lot of, uh, a lot of his stuff. Um, those are two of my favorites. And uh, in the scaling world, there's, there's a uh, professor um, who I think that his first work on this was back in the late 50s, early 60s, even Larry Greiner, G-R-E-I-N-E-R. -E -E he has one of the you know, top five uh, Harvard Business Review articles of all time. And it talks about evolution and revolution in organizations. So how organizations change as they evolve and mature. And, you know, the, the language may be a little dated and the examples are, are super old, but the concepts and the research there, you know, ring so true in today's high growth, high change world. Fantastic. Thank you very much for that. Andrew, it has been a pleasure having you on the show today. Thank you for sharing so generously on some of the things that all of our businesses worldwide are, are facing right now. So thank you so much. Such a pleasure. Really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you.